before we get into the teaching, I want to let you know that the year we just wrapped up, our ministry year sort of mirrors the school year. And so um, the year we just finished up the end of June is going to go down as the biggest year we've ever had as a church. God has grown us in all sorts of ways. We've had more people give their lives to Jesus, more people baptized, we've grown. And so we're making room for more people as we head into the fall and people start coming back from vacations. And so we're going to start changing some things up around here, adjusting some things. We'll fill you in in coming weeks, but keep praying about that. Keep inviting your friends. And it's, um, it's just great to see what God's doing here. And we're asking for even more moving forward. And we are in a series that we're calling Summer Shorts. And unlike Pastor Tony last week, who didn't have the guts to show her knees, I am wearing shorts. And so summer, yeah, I heard, woo. Um, put your sunglasses on if you, if you have to. But Summer Shorts is just a series that gives us the opportunity to take a look at short stories or short verses in the Bible. And today what I want us to do is we're going to take a look at a story that is familiar to so many of us, whether you grew up in church or not. And it is the story of the Good Samaritan. And the reason I want us to take a look at that story is because there is so much going on in the world around us today that's trying to divide us. There's so much that's going on that people are justifying their hatred for each other or their lack of love. There's so much that's going on. The rhetoric has been raised to such a level that people are screaming at each other and calling each other names and doing it in the name of God because what they feel they're doing is defending God's point of view. And so if they abuse anyone else or someone else, then so be it because they feel like they're doing the God thing. And so what I want us to do as we're in this whole time where there's so much turmoil that's trying to divide and rip us apart, not just as a country, but as a church, I want to let Jesus's words speak into that. And he tells the story that is so much to do with us today like it did back then. See, we think our situation is unique. Let me tell you something. Jesus' situation in his day was a lot like the mess we're in. So let's look at the story and then we'll learn from it. So Jesus says, or I'm sorry, the Bible says this. One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answers, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus says, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus responds with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Then Jesus asked, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, now go and do the same. You know, if Jesus was on the stage, he'd say the same thing to us. Those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, he would say, go and do the same today. Go and show love to the difficult people. Go and show love to the people we don't even like go and do the same. Hey, let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for loving us. Open our eyes, open our ears, our hearts, our minds, so that we leave here different than when we came in. Let us leave more determined to love like you love us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, so here we are in a story, and it sets up this way. Jesus was the greatest teacher that ever walked this earth. 
And everywhere he went, just about, he had crowds who followed him. And very often, the Bible says, people would shout out these questions to Jesus. People had a lot of sincere questions. They were trying to figure life out. And so they would shout questions out to Jesus and ask for Jesus' help. But what the Bible wants us to know is this is not what's going on here. This is a religious type, an egghead, if you would, who wants to trip Jesus up. He wants to trip Jesus up so everybody thinks he's so brilliant. So he's being set up. This is not a sincere question from someone who wants help. This is a question from an antagonist. He's pressing Jesus' buttons. Do we see any of that today? Wouldn't it be something if Jesus said, you are such an idiot, that's the stupidest question I've ever heard in my life. He doesn't respond that way, does he? Why do we think it's okay to talk in those tones then? This is a guy who's antagonizing Jesus. This is a guy who wants to trip Jesus up. Jesus responds with love, with dignity, and respect. Let's learn from Jesus. See, we call ourselves followers of Jesus. Let's follow Jesus' example. Let's not become like the world around us. Let's follow Jesus' example. So the question, you know, is, what does the law of Moses say? So Jesus turns it back at him and says, oh, you want to know what you have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, well, how do you see it? You're an expert. How do you see it? So the man responds, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, your strength, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, elsewhere Jesus says, elsewhere the Bible says that you can boil all of the Bible down to two things, love God, love others. It's that simple. Love God, love others. And we complicate it. We complicate it. Oh, there's got to be more than this. Love God, love others. You know what the really spiritual mature people do? They're not the ones who know Greek and Hebrew. They're not the ones who have the mysterious understanding of the book of Revelation. They're not the ones who have a thousand Bible verses memorized. You know what a mark of spiritual maturity is in the life of a follower of Jesus? They love God and they love others. See, this is simple, but it is not easy, is it? You want to be identified as a follower of Jesus? Let your life be about two things. Two things. Love God, love others. Yeah, but Pastor Rob, what about all the theology? Love God, love others. Pastor Rob, what about all of the issues that are dividing the church? Love God and love others. Amen. See, that's what Jesus is reminding us of here. And we, we think it's too complicated. We want to justify why we hate people. We want to justify why we ridicule people. See, Jesus says, yeah, love God, love others. Jesus says, yep, do this and you will live. Jesus isn't talking about eternal life only. See, the Jewish people had this understanding of eternal life was not just something in the future. It was very present. So eternal life is that quality of life that Jesus called the good life. Jesus called life in all of its fullness. So this guy's asking Jesus, how do I experience that peace of God in my life? How do I experience purpose in my life? How do I experience significance in my life? And so Jesus has this question thrown at him that we all wonder as well. How do I find meaning in my life? That's what this guy's asking. And the answer Jesus gives him is a simple one. Love God and love others. You want to have meaning in your life? You want to find the fullness of joy that Jesus came to give? You want your life to be filled with the peace of God? Love God and love others. You have a Pastor Rob, there's got to be more to it than that. No, there isn't. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will experience that beautiful life that Jesus talked about. Amen. It isn't that complicated, but it is not easy. Love God, love others. The man wants to justify himself because he knows he doesn't love everybody. 
Aren't you glad we love everybody and don't need to justify ourselves? See, this guy doesn't love everybody. Jews and Samaritans hated each other. Hated each other. They wanted nothing to do with each other. There were people in the religious system, the Jewish religious system, leaders, who taught the Jewish people that the Samaritans were dogs and half-breeds. That you did not have to love them because they're dogs and half-breeds. Does it sound like anything we're hearing today in our day? There were Jewish people who were very religious, who went around hating Samaritans and felt no remorse about it. Does it sound like anything we're experiencing today? The Jewish people had such a hatred for the Samaritans that the town where most of the Samaritan people live, Samaria, they would avoid that town. They would not even walk through the town because they did not want to be where the dogs were. So they would walk around the town. They would not walk through the town. They would walk for hours and miles around the town because they were too holy to become dirty by the half-breeds. This is the current that existed in Jesus' day. Does it remind you of anything going on in our day? And Jesus speaks into this. How about we as followers of Jesus Christ stop justifying our sinful acts and instead give Jesus what he simply wants, obedience? How about we do that? See, we call ourselves followers of Jesus, but we want to justify why we don't do what Jesus tells us to do. And Jesus is saying, you want to be my follower? Love God, love others. No exceptions. No exceptions. And it's to this that Jesus replies to the question, who's my neighbor? Because Jesus says, love your neighbor. So the guy, smart Alex, says, well, who's my neighbor? He responds with a story. Jesus could have picked anybody to talk about in the story. But he picked a Jewish traveler who was helped by a Samaritan. Two people who for generations have hated each other. Two people whose hatred is so deep that it goes beyond any one person hating another person. These are classes of people that hate each other. And Jesus tells a story about those two groups of people. If Jesus were here on our stage today and he were speaking to us, he would pick a group or a person that we struggle with and he'd tell the story about us and that person or that group. That's what Jesus is doing here. So what's Jesus say? A Jewish man is traveling He's beaten up by bandits, and he's left on the road for dead. He's basically just left there. By chance, Jesus says, a priest, a Jewish leader, the guy's Jewish who's half dead, a priest who is Jewish comes along, but he's too busy. He crosses to the other side of the road, and when Jesus says that, people chuckle, and we'll get to that in a bit, and he does nothing to help. A temple assistant Next, another Jewish leader walks over and looks at him, but he also passes to the other side of the road. Again, people chuckle. Why are people laughing? Well, this is the road that people would travel, and in many, many spots, it's not really a road. It's a trail, and on one side is the mountain. On the other side is a cliff. You don't have much room. And so when Jesus says that the guy was left for dead and the Jewish people were going to the other side of the road to cross over on the other side of the road, what Jesus is really saying is they're stepping over the guy to keep going. Why is it that we excuse ourselves from loving people? We all do it. 
And can I just give you a few reasons and see if they ring true with you? These are some of my reasons. We have an easy way of keeping arm's length from people or not loving people or speaking nasty about people who believe different than we believe. And so we have an easy time dismissing them. We have an easy time being demeaning to them because they believe different than us. We have an easy time dismissing people or not loving people who cause us to fear. See, there are genuinely people or there are genuine groups whose image or view of what they want this country to be or what they want the world to be, we believe is evil. We believe is wrong. We believe it's going to destroy us. And you can believe that sincerely. But your fear or my fear of a person or a group doesn't give me the right not to love them. Pastor Trey, a couple of weeks ago, Preached an amazing sermon on a one verse. God does not give us the spirit of fear. But of power and what? Love. There are scary people in the world. There are scary groups in the world. There are scary organizations in the world. God's not asking you to condone them. God's not asking you to agree with them. What is God asking all of us to do? Love them. Love them. When did we get to the place where as followers of Jesus, we believe if we love someone, we're condoning what they do or agreeing with them? When and how did we get there? It's not what Jesus teaches us. Jesus loved sinners. Good thing because we're all sinners. He's not condoning my life. He's not condoning my choices. He's simply loving me. Who are the people that we dismiss because of fear? Fear is a lousy reason not to love someone. Because God gives me the power to love. Another reason we choose not to love people is because we see the problem is too big. Right? So this hatred going on between the Jews and the Samaritans is generational. It's huge. And so it's easy to say, why should the Samaritan help the Jewish guy? The problem's too big. And we feel that way when we talk about the race issue, when we talk about the political issue, when we talk about the immigration issue. It's so big. What difference can I make? Can I tell you what difference we can make as a follower of Jesus? You can make an incredible difference to one person when you love them. One person. That's the difference God wants us to make. See, my reason to move away from people or not love people who are caught up in the race wars that are going on, who are caught up in the immigration mess that's going on, who are caught up in the whole political chaos that's going on. My reason to pull away if it's, well, I can do nothing to change it across the country. No, but maybe God wants you to change it for one person. One person. Hey, I didn't know JDL was going to be on stage. But since God put JDL on stage last night, I had to come over. If you were here in April or March sometime, JDL told his story. We showed his video. JDL is an undocumented. He was brought here when he was 12 years old by his mom. ICE picked him up and was going to deport him. And when all of that was going on, we were praying for JDL and asking the church to pray for JDL. And in April or March, we had JDL on stage and he told his story and we prayed for JDL. Now listen, I knew in doing that, there were going to be people who were going to say, well, we shouldn't be praying for people who are undocumented. Why? Why? So we prayed and we said, we're going to choose to love JDL. And we're going to pray that God makes a way for JDL to stay. And guess what? God did. Amen. Right? God did. But here's the thing. The weekend we told JDL's story and that we asked people to pray, there was a guy, he usually sits in the front row of one of our services. And this is a longtime police officer, a big law and order guy. And as I'm on stage with JDL that week, I'm looking and I'm thinking, oh boy, this is going to be a problem. Here it comes. 
And as I got into the lobby after that service, he was waiting for me. And he says, uh, Pastor Rob, can we talk? And I said, oh boy, here we go. And his first two lines to me were, I want you to know I'm a Trump supporter and I support the wall and his immigration ideas. And I said, okay, now he's really gonna lower the boom. And then you know what his next words to me were? I don't know JDL, but what can I do to help? Is that beautiful? And I connected the two of them. And from time to time, he still comes up to me and says, how's JDL doing? Is there anything I can do to help? That's loving someone. That's loving someone. Thank you, man. So listen, you don't have to agree with them. You don't have to like their politics. You don't have to like their ideas. Let's love people. Let's love people. See, the Samaritan loved him and did what was best for him. We can love people. We can love people. So Jesus asked, which of these three would you say was the neighbor? He's asking a smart aleck guy. Okay, we're supposed to love our neighbors? Which of these was the neighbor to, this, to the Jewish guy who was beaten up? And the man replies, the one who showed him mercy. It's an interesting response. Have you ever been around someone who's going through a real nasty divorce? And when you're talking about the person that they're divorced from, you mention their name, and they go, no, 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 stop. I've done that. And I say, what? Oh, no, we don't talk about them. Oh, I was just curious how so-and-so, no, 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 no. We don't utter their name. Woo! Why are people like that? Names have power. This Jewish religious type who thought he was so godly had such hatred for the Samaritans. He could not even bring himself to utter the word Samaritan. So he simply says the one who showed him mercy. Jesus says, go and do the same. Go and do the same. Go show mercy. Go show love. See, the Bible says speak the truth in love. Most of us do a lot more talking than we do loving. How about this week, we do a lot less talking and a lot more loving, right? This is a picture I keep that I look at. Hey, dude, I think I got something in my eye. Don't worry, I'll help you get it out. Where Jesus says, why are we trying to take the speck out of someone else's eye when we have a log sticking out of our eye? Why is it so easy to point out where everyone else is wrong instead of looking at our own issues and our own struggles? And what Jesus is saying is stop trying to fix everybody and let's start loving people. Start loving people. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is what? Is what? Love. Not righteousness, not theology. None of that. The greatest is love. What the world needs is love. Let's stop trying to fix people. Let's stop, try, stop condemning people and let's love people. Let's let God change people as we love people. Jesus said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Jesus didn't say your church attendance or your tithing or your serving or your Bible studies or your scripture memorization or your theology. Jesus said our love for each other will prove to the world that we're his disciples. Jesus said, go and do the same. Let's go love people and let's see what God does. Hey, let's stand. We're going to pray and we'll sing one more song. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your amazing love. Give us the ability as followers of Jesus Christ to love to simply love, to love the people you put in front of us, to love the difficult people, to be an example of what it looks like to love people, Lord. Not because we agree with them or we condone what they're doing, but simply because we're being obedient and loving people. And we pray this in your son's precious name. Everyone agree with this prayer and said, amen.